Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Kim Iverson of The Kim Iverson Show, a populist and independent thinker who questions everything. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Kim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I thought we could start by getting your thoughts on the increased authoritarian uh, and Orwellian censorship, which is happening in the West, in America and Europe. Uh, a few a few months ago, you covered the case of PayPal uh, banning Mint Press Consortium uh, and myself and I believe it was at the behest of the DHS because it was the same week, as you know, they rolled out the Disinformation Governance Board or the Ministry of Truth, which is now defunct uh, for now. And uh, But, th- you know, our example is just a drop in the bucket. And this is happening uh, to many people now. And, and worse things are happening to them. Bank accounts being frozen. Peaceful Americans are being put on terrorist watch lists and no-fly lists simply for gently questioning uh, the government. And so what do you sort of make of what is uh, unfolding? Well, obviously, yeah, I'm, it is very dystopian, very Orwellian what is happening um, and wrong, you know, flat out wrong. I mean, we should be uh, we pride ourselves in America on being a free society, on a, on having a culture of free speech. A lot of times people say, well, if it's not the government that's doing it and it's a private company doing it to you, you know, that's not a, a violation of the First Amendment. And that might be technically true. The First Amendment is for protection from the government. But we pride ourselves as Americans as having a, and, and the West in general, having a culture of free speech, not just the actual legality of free speech. And so, but there's also pressure coming from the government, which then to me does make it an actual First Amendment issue. Um, you know, if it is coming from the disinformation board and they are, and they are, uh, pressuring PayPal or pressuring um, YouTube, right, Google, and they're pressuring them to do something about misinformation. I don't know how that isn't a violation of the First Amendment. That sounds to me like a direct violation. You're putting pressure on a company, basically threatening the company, telling them that there will be something that happens to you that will be negative if you don't do this, right? That's the feeling these companies are getting. Otherwise, they wouldn't want to limit their own business. So they're not doing it for any other reason except for they are being threatened by the government or they fear the government in some way. But the culture of free speech is also worth protecting. It's not just about the government and what they're doing. It's about what we do to one another. And that culture, uh, you know, the pandemic really frightened me because I genuinely believed that, you know, especially here in America, my fellow Americans would not go along with mandates or censorship. I just really believed that it was ingrained in our culture to be a free people. And it really shocked me. It really did. It really shocked me when people went along and and not only did they go along, but then they demanded it of their neighbors and their family members and their friends. They started to exert it as well and say, no, you must, you must do these things. And now we we even hear people, lots of people that say, well, we must do something about misinformation. And so, yes, you should be shut down. You should be silenced. You should be turned into a pariah of society. And that is an extremely frightening, frightening situation moving forward. But I do have a little bit of hope because the fact that the Ministry of Truth was ultimately disassembled and you know kicked to the curb gave me some hope that maybe, okay, maybe Americans will tolerate it up to a point, but then they kind of were like, all right, wait a minute. Now we're really crossing a line and now, and, and kind of waking up to what's happening and kind of stepping out of that fear that was causing all of the the their uh, causing them to want to go along with this the you know censoring and mandating and maybe people are are less afraid and when they become less afraid they become more reasonable because fear just unfortunately takes over people and then we see most of the atrocities in the world that have been committed have been because a group of people were afraid so as the fear subsides we start to see people become normal again. Their brain comes back and starts working. And I think maybe we're starting to see that happen. So I'm starting to get a little bit, I'm starting to feel a little hopeful that people, especially as they've all caught COVID anyway, right? And they realize, you know, and then now that Trump's not president, because they all kind of got crazy brain, um, you know, maybe the fear is slightly eliminating, you know, lowering and people are kind of coming back to normal and maybe saying, wait, okay, may I don't agree with that anymore. I, that is a bit wrong. <laughs> At least that's what I'm hoping. I'm hopeful. That's yeah. Uh, a message from our sponsors. It seems we may be headed for the 1930s all over again. Financial collapse, tyranny and world war. I've already secured multiple passports, offshore accounts, safe havens and escaped to the sunnier shores of Mexico. 
My friend Mikkel Thorup of the Expat Money Show is hosting the Expat Money Summit with 30 plus experts that'll help you reclaim freedom in this fourth turning by moving your life and wealth offshore. Themes include securing your plan B bug out location, banking offshore, reducing your tax burden legally, storing precious metals, getting another passport, and more. Protect yourself and secure a new life abroad. Register now for free at expatmoneysummit.com or don't and enjoy surviving on insect protein while stuck in the metaverse. And don't forget to fund Geopolitics and Empire. You can leave a donation, except on Patreon or PayPal, which have banned us, book a consultation, or become a member. Yeah, I was, uh, I want to ask you about COVID-1984 in a bit uh, as well, but I spent uh, the pandemic in Kazakhstan and Mexico and Kazakhstan was part of the former, you know, part of the Soviet Union. And I thought, you know, and just like you mentioned, they, they all went along. And I thought, I mean, you guys were under the Soviet Union. You you should have been able to recognize this uh, tyranny immediately as well in Mexico. You know, they, we went through, you know, two centuries of two revolutions. And I'm like, where is this Mexican revolutionary spirit? You know, Pancho Villa and, and all of that. And everyone was just complying, masking up. Some people, I, I even saw a neighborhood wearing uh, two masks. Uh, but uh, just continuing along the line of this uh, censorship, you also experienced something. Uh, recently, you just left the hills uh, rising uh, after experiencing uh, sort of a, a different kind of censorship. They prevented you from uh, interviewing uh, Fauci. And maybe if you could give us uh, you know, your further thoughts and, and take on, on what happened and uh, as well, your sort of takeaway, your thoughts on the greater significance of, of what happened uh, to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, what happened was I had been on Rising for a year as one of their hosts, and um, I was never limited or censored or held back in any way. That was kind of one of the reasons why I agreed to be there and why I continued to be there and what I had told all of my viewers that I would never cave to that, that I wouldn't I wouldn't be there if I was being censored or limited in any way. And unfortunately, um, you know, it, they, they made some changes and in management or in ethos, philosophy, I'm not really sure, but they ultimately decided that an interview with Fauci was more important than me keeping my promise to the viewers and them keeping the promise to the viewers that they were not a, a mainstream corporate entity out to censor or limit. Um, and basically what happened was they had scheduled Fauci for an interview. I had covered extensively the pandemic on Rising. That was really, I mean, everyone, all the hosts talked about it, but it was definitely identifiably my topic on that show and uh, and my radars had brought in literally millions of views to the show on that particular topic so when fauci was scheduled to be interviewed i was excited i wanted to talk to fauci this was the time to finally face the person who had been the guide of the pandemic and uh, that which I, I believe ruined so many lives and so many re relationships, friendships, people lost their jobs, people, you know, it was just uh, many, many bad things happened during this pandemic. And it was time to ask Fauci some questions. Um, and they ultimately, the, the producers told me that I was not included in that interview, that they didn't, that the Fauci team wanted to know who the hosts were. And they knew instinctively that if they said my name, that the interview would not happen, basically, that the Fauci team would not agree to the interview if I was included in the interview. And so they decided that it would be better to not have me in the interview and to get the interview, which um, my argument to them was nobody cares about what Fauci has to say. He's everywhere. He talks to everybody. This is not an actual exclusive interview. Um, you already know what Fauci is going to say. And it's better for our audience if he, they reject the interview because they don't want to face us. And we just go and tell the audience. Fauci, who works for the American people, was unwilling to come and face the American people. And that's shameful that our government would behave that way. That's a better segment. And it is for the viewers builds more trust when they see that we're not willing to cave and lower our standards and lessen our integrity just for an interview with a guy like Fauci. But they they did not go in that direction. That's the direction I wanted them to go in. That is not the direction they chose. They chose instead to go ahead with the interview and to not approach the Fauci team to tell them that I would be included in that interview. Instead, the team decided to exclude me. I would have been fine if they didn't tell the Fauci team, but they included me anyway. And I just popped up <laughs> and I was like, hey, Fauci, um, that would have been better. That would have, And not only that, it would have made for better TV. 
which is their job is to get ratings, quite frankly, right? Um, but they chose not to go in that direction and they wanted to, they wanted, like many me in media, and this is kind of the problem with media, is it wasn't just about Fauci, I don't think, for them. I think it was about all of the relationships that they would get, all of the interviews they would get if they played ball with the Fauci team. And this is why we have such a problem in the news media is because especially those that live in D.C., the problem with with any media and en- entity living in D.C. Now, I'm not in D.C. and I've, I've only been to D.C. like twice or three times in my life. I don't have besides my coworkers that I've met and people that I've been on shows with that live there. I don't have friends in D.C. and I certainly have no friends inside the D.C. inner circle, the beltway. Like I'm not a part of that group. So I can openly criticize. I don't, I'm not worried about how it's going to affect my social status when I go out to a cocktail party. Am I not going to get the invite? I don't care. And the problem with the DC insider beltway is they all care because they're all friends. They're all married to each other. It's so incestuous in DC. So you've got media, you know, personalities married to government workers who are friends with this, you know, it's, a, it's an incestuous situation. And so they never want to upset each other. And so they don't ask the tough questions. They don't actually represent the American people and what the American people want to know. They're instead just keeping themselves on the Christmas invite list. And um, I believe that was kind of part of the calculation for them. They just were like, well, it's not just about Fauci, but it's about, you know, we want this relationship. We want this connection. We want more people that'll come on our show. But who who cares if you have them on your show, if you're not going to press them and actually ask hard questions? This is why none of the news media asks the actual hard questions. They don't want to upset their friend. And that is it, so they're not doing their job uh, and they should be called out for it. And unfortunately, the Hill fell into that trap for that moment. Now, I don't know if they've learned their lesson going forward from here on out. They might have after this, right? After me saying, I can't be here anymore because now you've lied. You've put me in a situation where I would be lying to my viewers that I brought here. And it's this, I would be risking reputational ruin because I promised my viewers I wouldn't have that let this happen. And it's now happened. And so now what am I supposed to do? So it's very possible that they learned from this terrible mistake and going forward, they will not make that mistake again. It's also possible that they they embrace, uh, you know, being more corporate and more establishmenty. So I don't know which way they'll go. I hope the best for them. I hope that they go in the right direction, um, at least, you know, on behalf of the American people who deserve a media outlet to go in the right direction. And we just don't have any at the moment. But um yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what happened. And, and the greater impact of that is just, again, you know, Americans not getting the real interviews we deserve. We're not getting the information we deserve because they're in this incestuous love, you know, bubble with each other and nobody wants to upset each other. And that's a mass, a, a massive problem. Yeah, that reminds me, uh, last year I got contacted some, by some, uh, media agent, uh, um pushing potential guests and they suggested they asked if i would have david rubenstein on and he's a member of the world economic forum and the carlisle group which is you know a key part of the military industrial complex and they suggested him on and i'm like sure bring him on and then they never responded i think it, it kind of similar to you they saw what kind of podcast i was and they're like oh we don't want david uh being <laughs> geopolitics uh an empire and i'm just uh curious maybe if you could give us an example of if you thought about you know, what's maybe a question or two that you would have pressed Fauci on? I think a big one is what is a vaccine? I think that's the most um, consequential question to ask him at this point is what is a vaccine to him? Because they are pushing the mandates and they're still pushing them on children. They can't go to school without getting these these so-called vaccines. They you know, we're still seeing the, the, the consequences. To me, that was the most significant consequence. And it's that they changed the definition of a vaccine, of what a vaccine is. And I would like to hear from him, from his own mouth, what is a vaccine? Because us, you know, normally when anyone thought of a vaccine, it meant, okay, if I go get the smallpox vaccine or I go get the polio vaccine, I anticipate I'm not going to get smallpox. That's the whole point of it, right? Otherwise, why would I get that? So I'm I'm assuming it's going to be sterilizing. Now, I understand that there is the rare chance that you might still get it if you get the vaccine, right? Those rare breakthrough cases that, that are genuinely rare in a situation like perhaps smallpox. I'm not sure. I haven't done the research on these other vaccines, so I don't actually know. 
but I'm assuming, right? This, I'm just going off of how I was raised, how we were all raised and what we were taught, that that's what a vaccine does. You get the vaccine so you don't get the disease. That clearly shifted somewhere along the line. And now there's actual consequences because of that shift. And I want to know, what is a vaccine to him? Is it sterilizing? Why? What, what is this? Like, cause, So that's what I think the biggest, he needs to be pressed on that. He needs to be on record clearly stating where we can share it over and over where he says, well, these vaccines don't do that. And um, they're not. And then asking again, then why are they called vaccines? Why would you call then they're clearly not actual vaccines by the definition of what we use vaccine to mean. That means something. Words mean something. So you've now changed that definition and there's consequences and children are being forced to take this before they can go to school. People lost their jobs over that over that dispute specifically. So I think um, a lot of us would like to see some clarity on that. I mean, you know, there's nothing you could really ask him that's going to, uh, you know, I, I doubt he would. Uh, I, I mean, I, the, the hope is that you could get him to say something on record that then people could use like in court or they could, you know, when they're when they're when they're challenging what they're being forced to do. And I think to me, that would have been the most consequential. That was the question I was going to ask him first. The most consequential question I think I could ask him. And to lead him down that path of, you know, why are people being forced to take this then? Yeah, there was a hilarious Mexican actor, I think, the first year into the pandemic. I can't remember his name, but people can find that online that did catch that did trip up Fauci uh, in the uh, interview. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, they've changed the definition of pandemic, of herd immunity, of vaccine, most recently recession. And I think they've also changed the definition of definition. (laughs) So right. it's really getting two plus two equals five uh, Orwellian. And, and, and to get your further thoughts, um, well, we see Rand Paul now is launching an in- investigation into the gain of uh, function um, stuff that's been going on. And, and you know, any, any further thoughts that you have on the never ending pandemic and biosecurity uh, agenda and something really important that happened yesterday. The Russian Ministry of Defense came out and said that they think well, they've got documents and stuff that the U- USAID could be involved in the emergence of COVID-19. They actually said, quote, we see a clear trend that pathogens that fall into the zone of interest of the Pentagon subsequently spread as a pandemic. The beneficiaries are American pharmaceutical companies and their patrons, the leaders of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Democratic Party, uh, end quote. And, you know, so so they they continue to evoke states of emergency, California, Illinois, uh, New York, you know, talking about monkeypox and polio and cholera, and it just it's never ending. And and I mean, do you think they're bring they're going to bring down uh, bring lockdowns back um, this fall or winter? And any any further thoughts on that? Oh, I really hope not. I I think people are tired, and I think everyone's got COVID by now, so they're kind of like, okay, you know, been there, done that, not as scary anymore. I just I don't think people are going to. I don't know. I mean, I say I don't think people will go along with it again, but I didn't think they would go along with it the first time. So I I no longer know what people are capable of or what they're willing to do. I but I I don't see how they could talk any of us into that at this point, just because so many people have had COVID already, even after being quadruple vaccinated. And uh, but, you know, maybe maybe they could because Paxlovid clearly is not working as intended. So maybe they could, you know, so before we could say, well, look, if you get it, then you at least have this pill now that you guys say is so effective. So why do we need to why do we need to worry about it? But now it's like, oh, we don't really know what that pill does or doesn't do. Um, so they might still try to justify it and say, well, we have to because we still don't have any we don't have a vaccine. We still don't have the the medication. So maybe they would use that as an excuse. But I sure hope not. I mean, I think all of us want to move on with our lives. And I I would hope that more and more people have woken up to the tyranny of this. But as far as like the lab leak and where the pandemic stems from and who benefited the most, I actually think China still benefited the most from this pandemic. So my suspicions, if I were to think of anybody that did this purposefully for some reason, uh, I would still be pointing the finger in that direction. and And that is they they just absolutely have benefited the most. They were the only country that had growth during the pandemic when everyone else was seeing, um, you know, everybody's GDP had gone down and China's increase, you know, went up. And so, and I think that politically, geopolitically, Russia and China together have actually gained more from um, 
uh, from everything than I think anyone else. And I, I, I think, you know, I, and I'm not like saying this in a sinister blaming way or anything like that. I'm just kind of pointing out w- the way I'm seeing things. I do think that there was, you know, much of the world rightfully, very rightfully, very sick of U.S. hegemony, very sick of Western, you know, just influence, flexing muscles, sanctioning, controlling the world, and particularly the U.S. and the, the power of the U.S. dollar and the weaponizing of the U.S. dollar as the global currency. Many nations had been absolutely fed up with that, rightfully so. And so I do think that there is a possibility that, you know, some of these countries got together and they thought, how are we going to break this up? Uh, Let's come up with a plan and play this like a chess game. And we all know that the Russians are very good at chess. And we all know that the Chinese are very good at a game of Go. And I, I, I would not put it past them strategically figuring out how to, um, how to weaken the West. And without going, having to go to war, without going to World War III type levels, but doing it in a very smart, strategic way and putting us basically in checkmate. And I think that they have successfully done that. So if I were to look at any players in the world that actually benefited the most, I actually think it's them. I, I do think that U.S. hegemony is definitely on its way out. Um, and we're seeing a new a new multipolar world rising. And uh, and that obviously is incredibly beneficial to those other countries that will rise up and be in that position. So I, I, I just don't know if our, le- I mean, I do definitely think obviously like US, we're definitely doing some experiments. We're definitely, um, we're, de- I mean, it, there's still absolutely a possibility for sure that we were involved in it. But I don't know if it was like this plot necessarily from the u.s i think that would be more carelessness coming from the u.s just like oh let's experiment oh shoot got out (laughs) i'm not sure if they're smart enough to like think of a plan and what would the plan be for but i do think certainly they've taken advantage of the situation that they had in front of them to exert more power and control over the population but i don't know if it was by design if that makes sense yeah. And uh, just to add uh, further thoughts, given what you've said, yeah, I've had many guests um, uh, as well as uh, give uh, similar uh, assessments as, as you just uh, have. And we had uh, so, as some people have called her uh, Grandma Kamikaze uh, Pelosi head, of, head over uh, to Taiwan and provoke uh, China. And then we've got the whole Russia-Ukraine situation, which sort of makes for the conditions for a third world uh, war. But, um, you know, any any further thoughts i know you've covered it uh recently uh, in some of your um uh, analysis uh, any further thoughts on on what's going on with taiwan you know pelosi and uh, russia and ukraine if i could understand the brain of our us politicians and what they're thinking when it comes to foreign policy you know I mean, minus just lining pockets of corporations i mean clearly what has gone on with taiwan is that you've got a bunch of manufacturers you've got a bunch of corporations semiconductor corporations that are worried about their product they're worried about their business and they're of course spending lots of money lobbying and funding politicians and getting them you know in their pocket and they are and and look the us military has been historically and e- even recently you know it's currently and historically been used not to protect people not to advance human rights or democracy or all these things they always claim to get us on board with it but instead to protect financial interests to protect resources right they say we want that oil so we're going to go and start a war and destabilize and make sure that we still control that oil we want you know, everybody's thing now that we want these semiconductors. We want to be controlling that. We don't want China controlling it. So all of yeah, and look, we need all of that. There's no doubt we have to have the semiconductors. You know, we have to have all these things. There, this is in everything. And so there's no doubt that that's necessary and it is a matter of national security. But they're just, you know, rather than focusing on bringing manufacturing back to the United States and making ourselves more self-sufficient, corporations don't want to do that. Rather than focusing on that, they instead pick fights, which are worse. There's just no way we're going to be able to take China on. There's just no way. Um, they they can claim, like what they say to us all the time, you know, the military an- analysis will come out and say, well, yeah, but China in a head-to-head fight wouldn't be able to beat, you know, we've got better weapons, we've got better technology, you know, we're, we're so further advanced than their military. And it's like, we don't really know. 
You know, they're, they're pretty secretive. We don't actually know what they have and what they don't have. And they know that they don't know. So they're just saying this and they're just flexing their muscles, but they really know that they don't know anything about what China's doing. We didn't know that their space program was so advanced that they could actually land on the dark side of the moon, right? Like they, we didn't know that. And then suddenly they did it. So we don't actually know what they're doing. They're very secretive. They keep things very close to the chest. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, fanning the flames over there in, in China is not a good idea. It's better to unfortunate, you know, it's rather than trying to bully countries into doing what we want them to do, we really need to start refocusing on making partnerships. But it's very difficult with the American mind because, you know, you've got like Biden going over to Saudi Arabia and begging the Saudis to help us out with the oil situation. And what do you get in the in the media, in the news media? You get anger and outrage, people saying, how dare you go and shake, you know, and, and fist bump and and, you know, these people are murderous dictators. It's always like the murderous dictators. So how, we can't partner up and do business with these murderous dictators. That's wrong. It's immoral. And I personally think Americans need to stop thinking about what's about that and how other countries run their countries. And we do need to be starting to thinking about what's best for Americans by just having these partnerships, taking a more Sweden approach. Sweden, that's like friendly with North Korea, you know, Um and they they just take this approach of that's your country this is our country you do you we'll do us we're we're this is business this is about business and i i do think americans need to um we have to we don't have a choice we have to start thinking more along those lines rather than no you're bad you're evil and we're going to fight you and then we put ourselves in a really bad situation because the ones we we're, we're trying to fight at this point china and Russia, these they have resources that are essential to people's lives. Russia has gas resources that are essential for Europeans. And same thing with Taiwan and China. We get everything from China. We need everything from China still. We don't want to be pay paying even higher inflation rates. All they have to do is just raise tariffs and be like, okay, fine, you know, 20% on everything. They know we still have to buy it. So, you know, it's just a bad idea, I think, at this point to be going and, and going about things the way that we are with our foreign policy, muscling around. Yeah. And to bring things uh, back home, uh, as you sort of did, um, a number of folks that I talked to say we're going through, you know, a fourth turning uh, and that the road ahead is seeming to be perilous uh, and dark, uh, a lot of stormy weather. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Biden regime seems to be not even popular anymore among the 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 democrats and you know some yeah. people even th there's talk of second civil war this crazy polarization and uh you know j just how do you see we, we've got the 20 uh the primaries coming up in 2024 elections just how do you see the the road ahead for uh uh america like the, the economy also doesn't seem to be doing well and uh you know any further thoughts uh, there I mean, as far as a civil war, I, I think there's too many independents in America for there to be a real civil war. I, we are very polarized for sure between the right and the left, but the majority are, are independents and the majority are just not buying into the extremes on either side. So um, I don't see us getting to that. There was a time when I was worried about that. I don't worry about that as much anymore just because there's a growing base of independents rather than people polarizing more. The polar, the polar size sides are definitely polarizing more, but rather than people joining those polarized sides, they're kind of going away from those polarized sides and saying, well, wait a minute, this is getting crazy. Um, but yeah, you know, where we're headed, um, you know, Biden certainly is not popular, even amongst the left, like you mentioned. Um, I, I do think that economically, we're going to see some real pain here, especially with these continued Rather than trying to alleviate the pain in America, Pelosi flying off to Taiwan made that worse for sure. China absolutely could just start slapping tariffs on us. Uh, we are so import dependent as a country, which is a real problem. And that to me is, I think, the biggest concern that Americans should have. And they do have, even if our politicians aren't really addressing it. Americans are most concerned about inflation right now and where that leads. And, you know, we know from wh where it can lead based on what we've seen in the news. Like if you look at Venezuela, you can see what happens when you have extreme inflation for what whatever the reason for that, right? There's, you know, we can talk about all day why Venezuela had the situation that it had. But when you do have extreme inflation, you know, you end up with that extreme inflation because 
you're an import heavy an import dependent economy. And then when you get cut off in some way because of sanctions or whatever those things might be, you know, it makes it, it, it then drives up those costs quite a bit, one of the factors. And so I do think that um, we're definitely setting ourselves up for economic, some real economic pain. And that will lead to higher crime. I don't know if it would lead to a civil war, but I certainly think we're going to see collapsing a uh, communities essentially here in America, where we're going to see we're going to go backwards and be um, less safe. There's a lot of danger, you know, a lot of crime, of course, because when people get desperate, they start to not care, you know. And um, but yeah, I, I do. I I'm uh, so then we'll see what I I think we're definitely at the point though politically where the era that we've been in, you know, we could say argue since World War II. But probably more so since the 70s, the era of politics that we're seeing that has just worsened over time, I do think we're kind of at the end of that. I think it's about to blow up and something has got to give. And uh, it, it might take 10 years. I don't know the length of time it'll take for that major shift to happen, but I do think we're in a major shift. And it might just mean the the old guard dies off. And when they, you know, when the Bidens and the Pelosi's of the world and they're all like old and, you know, they're already in their 80s. And when they're just gone, that we might see a major radical shift in how we operate as a country. And just to commenting on the what you said, the economic uh issues and social unrest the, the past two years being in Mexico. I've just seen many, so many Canadians, uh, Americans, Westerners just fleeing uh, to Mexico in mass, and uh, just to get uh, get back to the independent media and how you see it going forward. It's it's interesting. Just yesterday or the day before, I had my personal Twitter account suspended, like out of the blue, and then I noticed a number of other people have had had it also just yesterday, like this week, have had their accounts sus suspended or or deplatformed. Now, and I'm wondering. If they're they're doing this now, like uh, in advance of some, something that might be coming down uh, the line uh, again, as they did two years ago with with COVID, you know, maybe they're just testing, getting ready to to uh, deplatform uh, a new wave of deplatforming. But uh, just going forward, how do you see the alternative media space, independent media space? It seems um, it, it's 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 a long road for people to you know to build podcasts and do what we're uh, doing. But I mean. It, how do you see the road ahead for independent uh, media in the face of all of this Orwellianism? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm I'm actually pretty hopeful with independent media because there are some, you know, part of the censorship when we've seen this censorship happen with like Twitter, YouTube, we're seeing other companies come from that, right? They're building and they're saying, hey, join us over here. We're not going to engage in all of that. And so I think, you know, I'm actually hopeful because there have been some pretty powerful you know, like in response to YouTube, we've seen Rumble grow and Rumble's now growing really large and getting now I think they're at about 15% of YouTube's um, user base, which is really large. And so for Rumble to have 15% of that is is really great in the time period that they've been growing. Censorship and the and this issue is actually only helping those companies get larger and larger and larger. Um, and then we just have to hope that they don't get so large that they start doing it, which, you know, because that's obviously always the risk. And then another company would have to form to then counter that. But that that could be a while from now. And we're seeing, you know, just a growth, I think. And we're seeing that like with Parler or, you know, the growth of that compared from Twitter. People are finding other spaces and they're moving together. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me of the early days of the Internet when like you had all these different you know, ex browsers or ex that you could use and, and search engines and everybody kind of had, a, there's like a bunch of them out there, but eventually people start to conglomerate and they start to get more and use one more often than the others. And the other ones kind of fall by the wayside. And what we've seen with like the answer, the response to Twitter being so cen censoring is we see all these different ones try to pop up, right? You see like parlor and truth social and, um, and what, there's like a few that have kind of come up, come out, but now we're now it's kind of getting to that point where people are using all of them, and then they're like, okay, we're kind of moving and kind of trying to get into. There's like one that kind of shines above the rest, and that process is still happening at the moment. So I think you know I think Rumble was able to be one of the ones that have now risen to the top compared to like there's Odyssey, there's 
you know, a, f- a bit shoot or sh- is that really how it's called? So there's like, you know, different, uh, but some are rising faster than the others. And I just have hope that that's what happens, that there just is replacement that comes forward and people start seeking that out. So I'm hopeful, actually. It was more dismal a couple of years ago when they were doing it because those companies hadn't quite formed yet or they were in the early stages. They hadn't grown. And now they've rapidly grown largely because of the censorship that the, that's been going on. And people are now fleeing and going other places. So I'm still hopeful that everything will be okay. You know, it's just it. there will be casualties in the meantime, of course, um, because if their companies aren't built fast enough and they're not robust enough and they're not able to make the money, then people that get kicked off of YouTube, it's not as easy to just suddenly kind of pick back up. Same thing like when you get banned by PayPal or something, it's like, how do you then find an alternative to that? Um, if, if the alternative is in the early stages, it could be a death sentence for your show. But if it's already a little bit more developed, then it's not as bad, right? Then you can kind of join that and, and move everything over. But yeah, I, I'm I'm still pretty hopeful, actually, that sentiments and people are getting louder. And we're seeing people in the media that are calling it out. I mean, Tucker Carlson calls out censorship all the time on his show, and he's got the biggest show in news. And that's a good thing to have somebody that side, you know, it's like whether you disagree with him on a bunch of other things, doesn't matter. He's at least saying this one thing that's getting the message out there for the masses to hear and saying that there's censorship going on. You know, it helps. Anything helps. Yeah, I've got my TNT uh, live radio show as well that uh, keeps me uh, afloat. And um, is there any other than uh, issue that's sort of front and center uh, on your mind that we haven't uh, brought up? Uh, you know, anything that's you've been thinking about these days or, or a final thought uh, perhaps for us? Um, I mean, really, the censorship is the big one. And so is so the foreign policy. I mean, those are my two. You know, I talk about those two uh, quite a bit, as well as, of course, the pandemic, because that's just such a learning experience i think for so many of us to have to go through that um yeah so i uh no i i think that we kind of covered <laughs> those are the big ones all right well then uh so n- now you're back to being uh independent uh again and you're on uh, youtube and, and locals and and twitter so again where's the best place for people to to go to to find you and uh, as well as the best way to support uh your work yeah, so you can find me at just go to kimiversonshow.com and that'll actually route you to my YouTube channel. And then in my YouTube com, you know, in the uh posts for each video, I do place all of the information of how to find me in other places. I do have a newsletter. I have locals, which is really the best way to support my my work. That is where um that platform has been the best, you know, financially most stable, I would say, for an independent show like mine. Um so yeah, that's just go to kimiversonshow.com. Well, I, I really admire the way that you, uh, you know, th- that you've been b- brave uh, against the odds and, and you stepped down uh, to, and maintained your integrity. And I think this is one of the biggest answers going forward for, for everyone is not to succumb to this pressure. And I mean, it's and, and to risk the loss of, of livelihood. I mean, even even if it comes to that for the, the truth and uh, integrity. So again, thank you. I, I, I hope you, you're going to I'm sure you're going to keep doing uh, keep going on and keep doing uh, awesome work. And thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com. And I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find geopolitics and empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit and Twitter take down posts. And after the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, 
Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.